going to do a three-part series on uh, factors to muscle hypertrophy. Um, so the first part is going to be the hormonal stimulus, which is in the middle. Second, we're going to cover the mechanical, and then the last part will be the immune slash inflammatory response. Um, this may go to four parts. Like at the end, I might do a wrap-up, but for now, it's three. Um, so the hormonal stimulus to training, we really have like three main players. Now, this isn't like all-inclusive, but this is probably enough to cover... Um, the gist of it. So we have growth hormone, testosterone, and then IGF-1. We'll start with growth hormone. So growth hormone gets released when you use a lot of muscle mass, so multi-joint exercises, high fatigue, um, but not necessarily a high load. Um, growth hormone increases what's called translational efficiency. So that is translating a code, uh, like an mRNA code, into um, a protein. So you have like translation and transcription. Transcription is, tra is your, it's hard to explain. Uh, you're basically taking the code from the nucleus and you're making it into a, like a pre-mRNA and then translation is the mRNA into a protein. That's probably more um, in depth than you need to go. So that's sort of the first thing we're gonna talk about. And then you have this here, the post-workout growth hormone surge. Now, growth hormone is pretty much inhibited by insulin. So what most people, there was a thing going around saying, um, you know, don't have anything post-workout, don't eat anything post-workout because it blunts the growth hormone response. Um, even protein, because leucine has a pretty high insulin response. So that was quite popular because a lot of people thought that, you know, growth hormone is one of our main uh, players. Um, it says growth, so it's in you know, a growth hormone, you're gonna grow from it. And that's not necessarily true. Growth hormone doesn't have as much of an effect on muscle mass as something like IGF-1 does. This is more like bone, um, cartilage, soft tissue um, growth. So the whole post-workout growth hormone surge thing, that's sort of, it's missing the forest for the trees. So you're trying to look at like one isolated variable at that specific time. Like acute hormonal fluctuations, they don't really uh, mean much in the long term. If you get a spike at one time in the day, for example, post-workout, you're probably going to get a lower level at some other time in the day when you do decide to eat. So that whole post-workout growth hormone surge, that was, it was actually pretty popular a little while back. Um, I don't think it's really all that important. It plays a very minor role, if anything. And even then, it's like growth hormone doesn't really have that much of an effect um, on muscle tissue anyway. Uh, the second one is testosterone. So it gets released when you're doing high volumes of work you're using a lot of muscle mass, and you have short rest periods. Now, I've got an asterisk there, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, increased testosterone. So testosterone works more in the nucleus, so it binds to an androgen receptor, and you increase what's called satellite cell pro proliferation. Um, and basically what satellite cells do is they... You can kind of explain them as like stem cells for muscle. So as a muscle grows and it gets bigger, and it increases its fiber length, um, it needs what's called myonuclei to sort of govern that uh, length. So if eventually myonuclei will become limiting and the satellite cells can sort of fill that gap. They can then create or form, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure this isn't like my forte, but I believe that they sort of um, eventually turn into myonuclei and then you can keep the growth process growing, going. Now, the reason I have an asterisk there is because a lot of people will train with these sort of three factors in mind. So like here where you had the post-workout growth hormone surge, they will structure their training to get that. Same sort of thing here. There's a lot of people that structure their training and say, well, if you're having rest periods above a minute, it's kind of pointless because, you know, you don't get that testosterone surge, bro. And the whole issue with that is in the weight room, we're trying to lift load. We're not, it's not a cardio workout. So a lot of people, when they keep rest periods like 30 seconds or 45 seconds, and they're trying to get just the testosterone um, boost from it, but then you know the load on the bar goes down, it's, it's sort of, again, the same sort of thing as back here. You're missing the forest for the trees. There's not really... I'm not trying to say uh, short rest periods don't have any merit, because they certainly do, um, but it's more metabolic that you're trying to look for there, not so much the acute hormonal response. A lot of this will sort of double up when we talk about the mechanical stimulus. So... Some of this might make more sense in part two. Um, then the last one we have is IGF-1. So IGF-1 increases with primarily resistance exercise. There's a few studies done where they sort of compared um, endurance to a control to resistance. So they had like a few different exercise conditions and they didn't see any change in endurance training. So it's mainly from a tension stimulus, so like a heavy load. Um, again, it works on satellite cells proliferation. So 
Proliferation basically means growth. So the same sort of thing here, you grow the satellite cells or uh, you increase their number. And then activation is actually activating them to go on to then uh, make myonuclei. And then activation of protein kinase B, which then increases mTOR. So again, this will be more so <clears throat> sorry, in mechanical stimulus, but um, just to give you a quick overview, uh, protein kinase B activates mTOR and mTOR works to increase uh, translational efficiency as well. So same sort of thing over here, but we'll talk about that later. So looking at all of this, like in the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at like the three factors, it's like which one's mo most important. And although they all play a role, I'm going to say mechanical stimulus is probably the main um, factor that you should be structuring your training on. I wouldn't ever put together a routine and I wouldn't advise many people to put it together a routine that with the goal of just, you know, getting these hormonal spikes because transient increases throughout the day. Um, it doesn't really mean much. It's very, very little effect. And I'm not trying to say there's no effect, but in a lot of the research that they showed, even when they severed like the, um, the source from where the hormone was coming from, they still saw growth as long as you had that mechanical stimulus. So mechanical deformation of the fibers, so actually physically putting the fibers under strain, that seems to be like the most um, significant influence on growth. Um, and then you have your inflammatory and immune response, which we'll talk about in part three. But I just wanted to sort of explain that structuring training just for this purpose, it doesn't make a lot of sense because at most this has a very, very minor effect. Um, and I wouldn't be focusing on sort of these small changes. And even, even more so if you're a natural athlete, changes in the physiological level. So how we fluctuate throughout a day, unless you're putting in like um, an external source. So unless you're... Um, enhanced, then changes in the physiological range that we are, we see in uh, natural athletes, they, they have even less of a significant effect. So even test boosters, even a lot of the test boosters like DAA, you get sort of like a 40% boost, I think, and they actually showed that in humans. But even it, though it's a 40% boost, which sounds great, it's still in the physiological range and you're not going to see huge, like uh, enhanced growth from it. And I think t those sort of boosters might work better if you're in like a calorie deficit or you, ha you have a maybe like a reverse dieting where you're in a stage where you're uh, hormonally challenged, so to speak, where you don't have the best hormonal profile. That may help. But I think for the most part, I think really focusing on this is sort of missing the forest for the trees. So that's hormonal stimulus. Next will be mechanical. Then we'll talk about immune. <clears throat> And then I think after this part series, we'll go on to like neural. So I'll start talking about um, like rate coding and rate of force development and that sort of stuff. So I hope you guys enjoyed this and I'll get part two up shortly. Thanks.